Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is our presentation, High Score, that we're calling it. Um, we are today bringing in composer Gary Scheinman, game composer Gary Scheinman. Uh, we're presenting this on behalf of, uh, from SEA, IU Media School Game Design Department, Shoemaker Scholars, and Project Jumpstart. And we've gotten some support from Student Composer Association's uh, Composer Chat Series, IU Media School, Shoemaker, Inno Shoemaker Innovation Center, and the Jacobs School of Music Scoring for Visual Media Department. I'm going to pass it over to Larry Groupe to get, introduce our guest here, and then we'll get started on the presentation shortly. Hi, everyone. And again, thanks for being here. I'm glad to see such a big group. Uh, I think that's great. Um, I've known Gary for quite some time. Uh, we worked together on various other endeavors, and uh, we've been friends for quite a while. He's had an, a, just a magnificent uh, career. He's a very, very nice person. Um, and <laughs> and uh, he knows a great deal about, also, not clearly about gaming and game music, which is what he's known for, but he's also very, very astute in, in, in business matters and in licensing and performing rights and, and all the myriad of, of difficult and cloudy issues that we as composers need to understand um, because we have to manage our own careers. It's as simple as that. I'm not, I'm not expecting this evening to go into that. This is about Gary and his game music and his artistic per pursuits, but he's also just a, he's a very deep individual. Uh, I'm putting into the group chat his, from his website, his specifically his credit page. Most of you may know this already, but I thought I'd put it there just right now, just so you can, you know, gasp. And then um, I guess I might just leave it at that. Uh, and I will go back to Tim. Uh, who will tell us how this will unfold and, and, and moderate accordingly. Thanks for being here, Gary. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to have a presentation from Gary in just a moment, uh, but just so you know, after the presentation's over, I want you guys to be thinking about questions that you have for him about video game composition and the industry and scoring and the collaborative process in particular. Uh, and so as you come up with questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, you can also raise your hand. We'll do our best to, to call on you or mention in the chat that you have a question. We can get you unmuted and have you jump right in. So we'll pass it off to Gary. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Larry and Tim. And nice to see you all here. Um, so I guess I, I could start, I think, with a brief bio. Uh, Larry was very kind with, with his uh, description of my career. Um, I um, started scoring in the 80s. 1980s, and that was <clears throat> that was the prehistoric period, or pre-MIDI period, <laughs> pre-digital anything period. That was the that our technology was paper and pencil essentially, and live musicians playing instruments and recording it onto magnetic media. Um, you know, but I, I have a friend. I teach at USC, and I, I'm like really my best friend, John Rosenberg, is an, a film editor, and uh, he um, he and I started early together and I edited, I scored a number of films that he edited. Uh, and we both sort of, he, he grew up in the analog age and now of course we're in the digital age uh, and things have changed. But I think, uh, you know, we both certainly embraced that. And, uh, um, but I think there was an advantage and we agreed to, to, to starting in, an, in the analog age. What do you think, Larry? You started in the analog age. You, were, you did paper and pencil scores. Don't you think there was something valuable uh, that we learned absolutely yes and i still do i find it the fastest way to be creative i like to write a sketch on pencil and paper and then i turn back to my computer if that's what i'm doing you know to see if it if the emotionality of that p piece of music is working or not but it is for me still the literally the fastest way to be creative with the least amount of tech in my way yeah yeah i i i, I do sometimes write as well paper and pencil so I'm pretty addicted to my computer these days <clears throat> in terms of writing. So I, look, I got started in the 80s. I went to the University of Southern California. Uh, I have a degree in music comp from there. I just have a bachelor's degree. I don't have anything more advanced than that. Uh, but I wanted to get out into the world and I was very lucky. Uh, I had an opportunity early on to work for a, a composer team, Mike Post and Pete Carpenter. And they were uh, scoring numerous television shows. This often happens. And this is true now, you know, where composers assist uh, very busy composers and get opportunities to write. In those days, of course, 
they, if you have four or five television shows, it would have been impossible for one person or even two people to write that much music. So they had ghosts and the word, the term ghost refers to a composer who is uncredited, but is paid. So I was one of three unpaid ghost composers helping them at that time. And it was just an awesome opportunity for me to score television shows. I don't know if you guys know the A-Team or Magnum P.I. or Greatest American Hero, some of the more iconic shows that they were doing at that time. But for me, it was just like, I mean, I was writing stuff on Monday and Tuesday and getting it and hearing it in recording session on Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was, uh, and it was just all, you know, it was an orchestra. The thing that they did that was kind of unique, that was really not my thing, because I was really not so much into pop music, but what they did that was cool and unique at that time was they, because uh, Mike, uh, the younger of the two, was a pop music uh, writer and producer. And so he met Pete, who is a more experienced, uh, sort of traditional scoring kind of composer and a trombonist for that matter studio trombonist and uh they sort of got together and they they took like a, an orchestra and they put like a, a rock band or a pop music band in the middle of the orchestra so in fact really it was strings woodwinds brass percussion and then there was a band and literally the band was in one spot in the in the orchestra we were recording over at universal and universal used to have their own recording stage and that was just it was just writing a lot of music and learning a lot about recording process and what sounded good and how you know how how to um how to write the picture and that is you know essentially um what media composers do we write to picture or for picture um I, after that i ended up going off on my own in the 90s scoring a lot of television movies and and some features i never i never scored any huge giant feature films, but a lot of t television and television series stuff. Uh, in, in, the, in the early 90s, I did score some games, believe it or not. Um, there was a uh, technology called Philips Interactive. I don't know if you guys know what Philips, what Philips uh, Interactive did. They had a technology called CDI, CD Interactive. And basically, it was uh, video trees. So you would um, show a video and the player would watch and then make a decision. And then based on the position, you'd get to see different videos and sort of you would change the scenario of how this uh, this really sort of a, a movie. In a way, it, it was a video game, you know, it was maybe more accurate than what we now still call video games. So I scored a few of those. And in fact, in 93, I scored a, a game called Boyer, which is like Alfred Hitchcock's rear window. And we had an orchestra because CDI technology permitted you to record music and then use that and then take and uh, that that music and actually put it onto a CD. So prior to that, video game music was pretty much well, initially it was just mono uh, uh, MIDI triggering uh, a synth or a synth, synth engine. And then I think it, it advanced to like you could have two notes at a time, you know, and, and the composers who were doing that, by the way, were really talented because it, it took an enormous amount of, of creativity to take such a minimal amount of um, capacity and turn it into uh, some iconic music. But that was not my thing. I was I was more of a traditional scoring composer. So once uh, CDI, so once my friend uh, who was working at CDI, a producer went away and then CDI actually went out of, uh, it was owned by Philips Interactive, as I mentioned, and they went out of business. So, um, so I didn't score any games, but in the interim, we had some dramatic improvements in the technology and uh, Sony's uh, yeah, PlayStation, of course, was central to that. And then later Xbox uh, joined them and they, they still remain the two, two really um, important technologies that um, games are are played on for you know you guys you guys all know that so in 2004 however just by sheer serendipity uh my agent i have i had an agent at that time I, i'm not with him anymore but he sent over my resume to a publisher i don't know if you guys know do you guys all know the difference between a publisher and a developer anybody not know the difference in the gaming industry so i think you all know that do you want me to explain it would anybody like me to kind of explain it um 
but just briefly, I, I will explain it because sometimes people are shy not to, to say they don't understand something. But basically, uh, a publisher is sort of analogous to a studio, like you know MGM. Well, no, MGM's gone, but uh, Sony or or uh, Warner Brothers or um, any of the other big studios, Universal. Those are studios, and, un, and inside those studios, they have production companies that actually make the movies or television shows. Well, in a, in a game development uh, process, the publisher is like the umbrella, um, often producing um, or paying for the services of the developers. The developers are the companies that actually sit there and make the game. They actually write the code and they produce all the assets and et cetera. So you really are working day to day for the, develop, the developer. Remember. Um, video games is it our software so it and and in terms of business it, that is in some ways how they diverge from films and they think differently because they think at themselves as they are as software producers even though they've become very cinematic in style in terms of what, what we're used to seeing and playing in video games <clears throat> So my resume was sent over to THQ. It was sitting on a, another a, a neglected, forgotten technology called a fax machine. Although, by the way, if you if you want to contact the IRS, you have to fax them documents. I just I just had, I needed something from the IRS, and they said, "Well, you can call us." Of course, the line is busy twenty four seven, or you can fax us. I go, "Really? I don't have a fax machine." Yet. So I had to go online and fax them. But in any event, other than the IRS, nobody uses the fax machine anymore. But in two thousand and four, they did, and so my resume was sitting on on a um, over at THQ and. An executive there, uh, Rachel Gipiola, who was my girlfriend's roommate from college, and she had become an executive. And she says, I know him. You should check out his music. So that just kind of started a process where they took me seriously. They asked for some music. Um, we sent over some, some music. And they heard one cue on there, one music cue, that fit a project they were doing called Destroy All Humans. Anybody anybody here familiar? Anybody plays Destroy All Humans? <laughs> It's a fun game. It's a sort of a tongue-in-cheek game where you play like a, uh, an alien from outer space, a little green character who comes down and uh, tries to destroy all humanity. <laughs> Other than that, he's a, he's a friendly fellow. But uh, but it really was tongue-in-cheek. So they heard something on there. Now the th the background of the game was the game is set in the 1950s, and it, w and it was all sort of like based upon uh, 1950s American sci-fi movies. And famously, The Day the Earth Stood Still, it's sort of an iconic 50s sci-fi spaceship, you know, landing on Earth uh, film, had a fantastic score by the great uh, film composer Bernard Herrmann. So they were mocking things up. They were using sort of temp music from Bernard Herrmann. And they, and they heard something on my demo that sounded a little bit like Bernard Herrmann. Now, I am a huge fan and always have been of, of Herrmann's music. He was one of the great, you know, He's one of my favorite film composers of all time. So they said, hey, do you have any more stuff like this? Well, as it turned out, that game that I mentioned earlier, Voyeur, had a orchestral score that was done in the style of, of Hitchcock's uh, movie. They also wanted sort of Bernard Herrmann style score because Hitchcock was uh, and Herrmann were famous as uh, working together for, for you know decades. And so um, I said, yeah. And so I sent over all these orchestral cues that sounded very much like a Bernard Herrmann score. And they said, this is great. Will you do a pitch? A pitch is an original demo. And I said, no, because I thought, you know, if, if, if they don't like that, like they're not gonna like my demo. Because anybody who knows anything about uh, music um, uh, software that we know that since 2004, samples have come a long way okay and back then they sounded pretty mediocre uh, they sounded okay but not they just sound so much better now so i just kind of thought they just they've just been excuse to not to hire me well then all of a sudden it went away and then two months later they called me and said we want you to to score it so i i ended up scoring destroy all humans and i was not a gamer i was totally oblivious i mean i knew gaming was out there somewhere and it was interesting and you know there were it, it was a becoming a really big business but it just was not my focus and all of a sudden i started getting these um uh, movie files of gameplay movie files and i was going wow this is amazing i was like i was just i was you know like kind of the farm kid who comes into the big city going whoa there's 
buildings here, big buildings. You know, I was really kind of unfamiliar with how cool and how technically advanced games had gotten, you know, in, in a matter of a decade or two. And so I was really intrigued and I had a great time scoring that game. I really did. I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> they gave me an orchestra, which is my favorite thing. I really, I am at heart an orchestral composer. That's my, that's what I love doing the most. I certainly do produce scores that aren't orchestral or that have mixes of orchestral and synth, but I really do when I have the opportunity. So I ended up scoring that here in LA with a, with a big orchestra and I was just thrilled. I said, you know what? I really think this, this is the, this is the new frontier. You know, this is uh, cool. I want to, I want to spend um, at least some of my energy trying to get, find more opportunities in gaming. I went to the game developers conference in 2005. Nobody knew me there because I had, they did, the destroy humans hadn't even come out actually by then. But I was just fascinated and I was going to, you know, seminars and whatever panels that they have. Anybody here attend the GDC? Has anybody ever attended? It's, it's of course, it's been, this will be the second year where it's not going to be live because of COVID. But maybe next year, fingers crossed, um, we'll be back to a normal. Uh, but it's been in San Francisco for many years. And uh, it's just, it's a great opportunity to be around thousands of people who, gathered together who are all professionals, mostly really professional. It's not really a fan event. It's expensive to attend. And so it's, it's, if you're serious about being in games, I'm not talking just from a music perspective, but any aspect of games, it is a great place to find out what's going on, what's the latest technology, who are the people producing those games, maybe meeting them at some event or introducing yourself. So it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So I, I, I just really, uh, push myself to um, find opportunities. And I started, when Destroy Humans came out, it was a success. And uh, my score was nominated for some awards. Well, I didn't win any awards, but it was cool to have them to be nominated. And um, and so then I started scoring other, other games. Now, the audio director for Destroy Humans, Emily Ridgway, went on to get hired at Irrational Games in Boston. And Irrational was making Bioshock at the time. And so she, she just hired me. She just, basically they didn't, I didn't have to pitch or, any, or anything. Just, she just said, this is, an, this is an amazing game. You should really do it. And I was like, yeah, of course I would love to do it. And that, um, that turned out to be a really creative and fascinating opportunity. Um, uh, that was a, sort of a groundbreaking game, I think. And the score was uh, allowed. I mean, Emily literally said to me, the score shouldn't sound like any other film, television, or game score. It's got to be like completely different. Of course, that is a very intimidating thing, you know, <laughs> say, well, what the hell do I do? You know, but um, I, I eventually, through experimentation and trial and error, found some really interesting ideas and uh, that she really loved. It took a while, though. It was, it was really a lot of experimentation and um, finding some really interesting ways to, because it's a very, it, it, I'm, some of you I'm assuming have played Bioshock or one of the Bioshock games. Yes. So uh, it, it's a really crazy, dark, scary world. And I scored Bio, and then I, I ended up scoring Bioshock 2 and Bioshock Infinite. All really intriguing games. Of course, Bioshock Infinite quite different in most respects, uh, at least externally, because you're in a city in the sky, you know, sort of like the polar opposite, you know. But um, so that that has just been, you know, and I've been I've continued to work. I, um, I did a, a game called Shadow of Mordor and then I scored Shadow of War. So those are two very big games from Monolith, along with um, their in-house composer, Nathan Griggs, who's who's actually quite a, a amazingly good composer. Nathan is fantastic. So um, I wrote a little more. I probably wrote 60 percent of the music. He wrote 40 percent. But he also had to implement it all and do all that stuff. And we'll talk about implementation and how music gets placed in games and, and the difference between game music and, and film music in, uh, in, a, in a moment or two. So I did, I did those games. Um, I just, I scored a really interesting game recently. My most recent game that's come out uh, is called um, uh, um, Metamorphosis. And Metamor Metamorphosis is based upon Franz Kafka's famous book, 
where you know the first line of the book is I woke up and I found out that I was an insect, you know. And so you play as an insect in Metamorphosis. But what was intriguing to me, and, and I didn't, again, I was invited by a friend of mine, Nikolai Stransky, who is also a composer. And he said, he contacted me one day, <clears throat> he is Polish. And the game is made by a Polish game company, Ovid Works. And he said, I've got a really interesting game and I want, want to know if you'd want to co-write it with me. And he told me it was based on Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. And I said, you know, that sounds cool. That sounds really cool. Because as, as soon as they, as, I mean, the term, the uh, Kafka's last name has become, you know, a, 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 you know, the word for the bizarre and crazy and, and, and insanity is Kafka-esque, you know. And so I thought it would be really an intriguing opportunity to write music uh, that was really interesting. And and I and the more I, I write, the more I look for those kinds of opportunities, even if it's not, if it doesn't pay the most, you know, um, I, I really love those creative things. They really stimulate me creatively. So we just won an award for that, that score. It's, it's um, the game, the, well, the, the, the book is, is um, written in what I would describe as the expressionist school of art, which was a German school that took place in the early 20th century. And, and it was uh, paintings, you know, by painters like Gustav Klimt and Egon Schule and um, composers like um, Webern and Berg and, of course, Schoenberg. Uh, and, uh, you know, as well as books like Kafka's books, you know, it, it was a really interesting movement. Uh, hey, Norbert, how are you, man? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, and uh, so it was really it was really uh, a, a a very interesting creative uh, period in art, and so I thought, how cool! And one of the one of the things that um, was interesting about that is Schoenberg um, wrote a um, a piece of music called Perogonere, and in it he invented this new style of singing called Sprechstimme, and so Sprechstimme involves this type of um, singing that requires the singer to sing half spoken and half sung. And it has a very distinctive tone and it has a very ironic quality. I wouldn't say it's not ha ha funny at all, but it has an ironic quality. And I thought just perfect for this game because the game is ironic and has humor in it. And I'll show you some examples from Metamorphosis perhaps in a, in a few minutes because I think it, it, it was really an interesting experience. Um, and, and it was and it's been really well received. Um, I've been, we've been nominated for two other awards. We'll find out, forget them, but I did win the SCL award for best interactive um, score. So I'm really happy that it's been recognized because it's so, it's so weird and it's so unusual, but I love, I love those types of opportunities. Um, so I've just, I really have just in the last 15 years, no, it's more than that, 2004. So it's almost uh, 17 years of, uh, working in games primarily although i still score uh film and television and um i'm going to score a film uh, this summer uh but i would say most of my work is in games and i i really do i i consider myself um um like uh, lou gehrig the luckiest man in the world if anybody ever know ever seen the movie about lou gehrig <laughs> of course he was dying at the time uh, but uh, I do consider myself extraordinarily lucky to have found opportunities. You know, I think there's creative people in the world and, who are frustrated and, and are enormously talented and they just didn't have the opportunity presented to them where they could sort of blossom. And, and so I, 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 I found that in games because by far the most interesting music anyone's ever asked me to write has been for games. It just really... Uh, nothing comes close in, in the films. There, I'm not saying that's true in general of films, but it's been for me the opportunity to write really cool and unusual music. And, I, and that's, what I, that's really what kind of keeps me, you know, excited about waking up in the morning, having an opportunity to write something really, really interesting. So, and I'm, I'm today I'm, I'm, when I get off, I've got music to write. I'm working on a game now. I can't talk about it because it, it is, um, a secret, um, but it, actually in in June, in June it will be, uh, it will be. Um, well, it, the game has already um, been announced, 
but my participation in it will be announced in June, but I can't talk about it until then. Um, but that's, it's also a fascinating game. It really is. I'm really enjoying working, working on that. Um, so yeah, so I've just, I'm just really, really lucky. And, oh, by the way, the other thing that I love about the games is the people, the people, I, the, the nicest people I've ever worked with um, has been in gamings as well. They just are, they're sort of nerdy, but so am I, you know, in a, in a cool way, in a great way, which just takes the stress of it. It does not mean that they're like, if they don't like something, they will tell you, but they're just, it just, you know, the, the, the quality and the niceness of the people, you know, I call it, it's, it's the Minnesota of the um, creative world, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of like everybody's kind of nice, you know, if you know the joke about Minnesota, but, uh, and I've been to Minnesota and it's kind of true. Um, but in any event, uh, I just, I just really have loved it. Um, so that sort of gets me to here and, and why probably Larry invited me to speak to you guys, because <laughs> if I'd never done any of that, I would, wouldn't be talking to you. Um, and so I, I could, I, I'd like to talk, I guess a little bit, and I, and I want to have plenty of time for, uh, for questions and I hope you guys have a lot of good questions. Um, but, uh, what I think it is interesting, the difference between scoring films and, um, and games. There is, by the way, a lot of overlap. Think of two concentric circles that overlap in the middle. Uh, because, you know, well, the main, the, of course, the main difference is when you're scoring a picture, as in a film or television show, you're writing always locked to images, okay, and to dialogue and to sound effects that do not change they're immutable i mean they do edit of course to the last minute and they are mutating as you, as you work to the frustration of composers but at some point everything locks and freezes for forever you know now there there are instances certainly of scores being re-recorded um um but other than that but that's usually because you know like when some of these scores were like um I want to think of Prokofiev scores for the Eisenstein movies that the music is amazing, but when it was recorded in mono, it sounded awful, you know, so um, those those have been beautifully re-recorded, you know. But in any event, um, it's really um, locked a picture that never, never changes. And so you're writing to the nuances of the picture. And that does not mean that you're catching every everything that happens. Uh, that's that would be more sort of in animation or cartoons or whatever, where you know almost uh, Carl Stalling famously uh, scored all the Warner Brothers cartoons, and literally every step that the, the characters make, do, 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 you know, is caught. And that's of course uh, a, the term in film scoring is Mickey Mousing, you know, where you just are catching every little nuance, every every everything that that the characters are doing is is you know somehow mimicked or caught by the music. Um, but in film scoring and in TV scoring, it's really more the art of choosing the, the moments that you want to hit and not hitting everything or maybe hitting very few things. Sometimes that's the, the more uh, creative way to play it uh, or just picking those really, really wonderful moments. I, you know, one composer I really um, love the way he catches things is Alexander Desplat. Um, if you watch his scores, they, I think they really masterfully uh, catch the moments and the changes. And, and sometimes it can be quite subtle, you know, and, and sometimes that's the best way to play it as a composer, you know, where it's just you change something subtly um, and it's not like a big, you know, simple crash or anything, but it's just a, a subtle change that somehow changes the character of the music that reflects something that's going on. It could be as, as something what's going on in a character's mind. It could be some, you know, the car starts driving and all of a sudden uh, the guy behind you starts shooting at you. That, of course, you that might be a more radical thing. You know, you want to catch that action kind of a sequence. But, you know, all those, the, all those kinds of decisions are a locked picture. But, of course, in video games, um, some of, not all of the music, but much, if not most of the music is, uh, is not locked picture. So for instance, if a player, because the players are making decisions, therefore the, any one player is going to have a different unique experience 
based upon what decisions they make in while playing a game. Okay, so you guys all know that a lot of you guys are making games. So how do we do that musically? How do you um, capture or how do you write music that fits, that generally fits, but doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily locked to picture? Uh, and we'll get to the moments when it is locked to picture. But um, so the way to do that, I mean, of course, the simplest, easiest way to do that is uh, is to loop the music. So you write a minute or two minutes of music and it just repeats and it's just, you know, goes and goes and goes and goes. And, and the only trick to that is that you, the music has to um, uh, really at the end of the music has to seamlessly go back to the beginning. And if you have some reverb tail at the end, you have to make sure that that also uh, shows up at the beginning of the music as well. Um, but other than that, it just goes and goes and goes. And so the advantage of that is that it's kind of, you know, it's pretty easy to do. And and I would say, if I had to guesstimate, I would say still most game music is just is looping music, you know. 57.3% um, of, <laughs> no, there's an old joke about, you know, 37.73% of all statistics are made up right on the spot, you know, like that one. <clears throat> so I don't know what percentage it is, but it's a lot of music. And I'm because I'm still tasked to do, and, and I talked to my friends, we're, we're, you're still tasked to do uh, a looping music. That said, there are some very sophisticated techniques that have developed to make this, uh, to make what the player is doing, to have the music comment on it in a way, because what, what games know is what the player is doing at any one time. So let's say you enter a an old abandoned house, okay? And so the, the game knows, because remember, audio is made up, of, just like in a film, of um, sound effects, um, sound and sound effects, um, dialogue any, or any talking, and, um, and music. So those are still the three elements. So let's say you enter the house and as you open the door, the door squeaks, okay? So that squeak sound has to be synchronized with the opening of the door and games can do that really brilliantly. They know that there's middleware called um, called WISE or FMOD and other software products that basically are sent signals from the game and that have that say the door is opening, play the door opening squeak sound, okay? Uh, and similarly, it can also say the door is opening, start the music now, okay? So now you have a piece of looped ambient music that perhaps has a sense of, uh, of danger or you know, some sense that something, something disquieting might occur in this house, this old abandoned dark house, you know. Um, and that can loop until let's say you open a, a door and a zombie comes screaming at you out. So at that point, you might want to catch that. And so you could do something as simple as have what are called stingers. And a stinger could be a separate audio file, musical audio file that sits on the software and just waits to get triggered by that event. And so it could occur any time during the music. It is a separate audio file and it can occur at any time. And so that way, though, if you want to catch that musical, that visual thing, the zombies coming screaming at you, or make whatever sound zombies make and um, attacks you, you can catch it, you know, and 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 you can catch it right on right on the trigger of, of opening the, the zombie door. You know? So that I mean, that, that's a simple way to make the music more interactive to make it capture what that player is doing. You can also have the music um, composed in what are called layers. So that you have uh, different different levels of intensity of the same music that can be cross faded to, and so for instance, let's say you have let's say you have a, a war game, and so you're let's say, say it's a World War II game, and you're walking around the rubble of a city, you know, and you know the Germans are somewhere, but you, and so you maybe you have some tension music. It's not particularly active, but then all, let's say in the distance you see German troops, you're the enemy, you know. And so at that point, you can crossfade the music up a level and you may want to increase the tension uh, at that moment because you, the player is now aware of a potential uh, danger, you know. And then let's say they start shooting at you and you start shooting back. Now you have a much more intense level because you have true combat music, action music that would really 
sort of help the player, you know, get the adrenaline flowing or whatever. So that would be three layers of music that you could not only crossfade from the lowest level to the most intense level, but you could go back again. Let's say you you get away, you dip away from the combat around a corner and you duck into a, a house or something, and you don't want the same level of intensity of combat because you're not fighting anyone and you're sort of away from the action. So you can, you may choose to, to wait for the player to be there for a period of time before you um, crossfade down again. But at some point you want to crossfade down because you're no longer, it, it would look, it doesn't, it's not matching the action of the player. If you have this intense combat music and you're kind of just sort of ducking away, cowering in a house, you know, <laughs> because you don't want to, you don't want to be involved in the combat, but that's your option as, as a player. So you can see how, the crossfading between those three layers could easily help the player and really have the music be interactive and really fit what that individual player is is um, is doing at any one moment. Um, there's other and there's other techniques. Um, a lot a lot of music these days is being composed in smaller cells, and it may be three or four bars or something as small as that, and you're crossfading or moving between them and you're creating a very interactive experience for the player. Um, I, and, and I was, you know, I, I just was talking to a team of, um, of guys uh, developing some technology for composers to use and their technology permitted some very, very interactive stuff, but you kind of had to compose the music in these cells. And I, so they wanted my opinion. I said, look, my opinion is that it's it's very interactive and that's cool, but it, it, it you know I'm getting getting back to that cartoon analogy. If the music gets too interactive, it's distracting. Think about this: let's say you're walking up and down a set of stairs, and each set of the stairs is a different note in a major scale or a minor scale, whatever. Do 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 do. Do, do, you know, so, you, so as you go up or down, the different notes appear. Well, now this is not, a, if this is a music game, okay, cool, that, that could be fun. But if it's not a music game, what are the players are gonna start playing, walking up and down the stairs? They're gonna start playing the, the, the interactive, you know, um, interactivity of the music, and that's distracting. And that's not the point of music. Music should not be distracting. So music that's too interactive, I believe, and, uh, and this is actually, uh, I was, Someone, you know, Marty O'Donnell, who wrote the music to Halo, was the first one that sort of gave that analogy. And I thought, you know, that's absolutely right. If the music is too interactive, it's distracting. And that's not, that's not what the music should be. Um, also, if the music is written in these really small cells, I think the creativity of the composer to write something more thoughtful and interesting and meaningful is limited because you're really locked into these small little structures that are not that that can make the music very interactive but it can also make the music pretty dull and uninspired so too much interactivity can i think cause um cause the music to to be less um yes less useful because i think what the player wants is the, it's the same thing as as they uh film viewer wants you want you want to be drawn in you want to have this sense of flow and involvement and you don't want to be distracted you know and i think that i think it could be true of film music that music can be so overwhelming or overpowering or too loud or whatever that it actually could draw you out i've seen films where i've disliked the music so much it was like oh man turn it off you know um and I think, you know, Larry, don't you agree that, you know, sometimes, the, you know, and we all, we all fight to have our music heard because usually what happens is in the mix, in a film, whatever, it's like, man, the, you can't hear the music. You know, what's the point of even, why did I even write this music? It's so low, you know, but, um, and so that's, that, that is a legitimate argument to present to the director. But if the music's too loud, I think that also can be distracting. And the, similarly in a game, if the music is um, too interactive or too loud or anything can be. So it's really, it's a fine balance, you know, it's, it's an art and um, decisions have to be made. And sometimes people will, will very intensely disagree. I remember seeing the movie, Let There Be Blood, which has a very intense Johnny Green score, aleatoric kind of score. 
And uh, some people hated that music and others just loved it. So it really was a bifurcation of the audience uh, um, based upon how they reacted to it. I remember initially being a little put off by the music and then in watching it again, I found it very cool. So I kind of had a, um, you know, I had kind of came full circle on that that one. I, I did really like that score. I have seen movies where I thought that music was really distracting, and you know, we got to we got to admit this fellow. There we go. Um, so so yeah. So that sort of, that is sort of just a quick overview of interactivity, and there's other techniques that can be employed as well. Just cross fading between music, um, and then of course there is what are sometimes called cutscenes or in-game movie files. And those are often done at the end of a, of a level and you finish it and now you, it sometimes is a reward, sometimes it is information you need to go on to the next level. And they're often CGI movies uh, and you score them. You score them just as you would picture. They're, they are, and sometimes they are absolutely stunningly beautiful a CGI technology is being used. I've, I've worked on games that have had just really beautiful cinematics. They're really fun to score. And, on, and as a matter of fact, on Shadow of War and Shadow of Mortar, both had a lot of cinematics. I wrote, I wrote an hour's worth of cinema um, scoring on both of those. So I kind of, I scored, I, I, I like to tell people I scored a movie and a game, you know, uh, because it was, there, was, there was just so much Two picture scoring, which which I really I really loved um, as well. I really, I still I still love writing to picture. I still really dig that. In some ways, it's a crutch <laughs> because it's like you have this sort of dramatic arch. Arch is right right in front of you. You kind of have to do it when you're writing um, a game music. Um, sometimes you have there's a lot of um, freedom that the composer has. You're still writing, and the way it generally works is the composer is provided uh, a video game um, capture game capture. So somebody uh, in the um, at the studio, because I'm a contracted composer. Contracted composers are I'm, I'm not a an employee of the studio that's hiring me or the developer that's hiring me. So I usually am not living in the same city and I'm not going into their office. So someone at the studio is playing the game and doing a video capture of that gameplay. And they're providing me that video, they're just sending me that file over the internet, and I use that because that is where the music will be heard. So it, it's very helpful to set an environment, like what is this, what does this look like? What does this feel like? And I and actually lock up to that. You can, you know, with, with digital audio workstations, with DOS, uh, we can lock to picture. So I'll lock to it knowing that I'm not hitting anything. If, I, if I'm hitting stuff and being thrilled about it in a, in a video game capture, I don't know what I'm doing because that is just one person at the studio playing it one time and no one will ever play it that way again. And so I would, I, you know, I, when I teach um, this, I go, look, do not score this because you're not. And in fact, it can be distracting if you have something, if you're building to something and, and some, um, something that you're provided with because it's, it's sort of like it fits the, the, the uh, video capture um, it can be distracting too because if you're if you just want an ambient piece of music say you're exploring you, you get a lot of these um, scenes called explore uh, moments so you've kind of entered a new realm or something <clears throat> a new place a new environment and you're at first you just want to explore it you know so they want some music to kind of maybe take the curse out of that somewhat boring activity it can be boring it can be quite interesting too but the music can enhance it in any in any way in any way, so it will enhance it. So, you, but if you are if you have some kind of build, dramatic build that gets too intense, you can have you can have some dramatic arc to it. But if it gets too dramatic, well, you're going to actually the player is going to be looking around, um, going where's what's coming at me? You know, there's like I'm a, I'm about to be attacked or something. That can actually be distracting because nothing you know it's just. It's just sort of a playground. It's a sandbox um, adventuring around in the game at that moment. And and if you are going to actually, let's say if it's in Shadow of Mortar, if you're going to start attacking the orcs or something, then that then things are going to change at that point. And um, you probably have another piece of music that would capture that moment. Or maybe there will be silence for a while. And, and I don't believe... I don't believe wall-to-wall -wall music in films or games is effective. I really think there needs to be a time for the music to go away and then for it to come back at an 
in a moment where um, dramatically it, it helps, you know, it really does its job. It does something interesting. So I think wall to wall is, you know, often used by filmmakers and game makers who feel like their, their product is not powerful enough to engage and they think the music's going to kind of save it. But I don't, I don't think that's usually the case. So, um, yeah, so that, so that's generally how I write that music. I have video game, um, gameplay, I lock it up to picture and that use that. And then that music has to be sent to the developer. I, I record it here in my digital audio workstation. I use digital performer and, uh, send that, um, stereo wave file to them. And then, and then it needs to go into the game. They will, they'll have, they have what's called builds of the game. And so as the game is being developed, they have working prototypes or builds and they'll put the music into the game and they'll test it. They'll play that. How, how does it feel? You know, it's one thing to say this works theoretically and it sounds fine, but until we, until they get it into the game and they really sort of play with it and they see how it's feeling and look and how the whole vibe is, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the a critical test, you know, and then, and sometimes you get feedback based upon that. And it's like, well, no, okay, it's, it's, it's great, but it's, it's, it's really sort of pushing too hard and maybe take the tempo down a little or whatever. You get some important feedback from, from uh, testing um, in the music in the game and, and, or it's like, it works perfectly. You know, you're, you're good, approved, move on to the next um, cue or whatever. So, but of course the, the cinematics, we talked about that. There's, there's also, um, music for the user interface. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different um, moments where the music where music is used in a game. Um, it can it can suggest a character location, enemy, enemy location or proximity to the game. The music can actually serve a, a purpose that is not used so really utilized in a film where it can, it can actually um, sort of tell the player important information like, the enemy is getting close. Maybe you can't see them, but they are. So the, there's some proximity danger from from your your enemies, and so that can actually play into the uh, the way the music is designed. Um, certainly, the level of suspense uh, and, and and yes, the emotions that the player would be feeling. Sometimes the music can be quite beautiful and emotional and have and be tugging at the heart heartstrings, you know. More often than that is combat music. <laughs> I must say I've written tons and tons and tons and tons of combat music. And I'm working, and when I get off today, I'll be writing more combat music. <laughs> I, would, I would say I was not particularly adept at writing action and combat music until I became a game composer. And now that I've written like 30 hours of combat music, I don't know if it's 30 hours, but it's a lot of combat music. So I've gotten pretty good at it. And um, you know, so the secret I guess to doing anything really well is to do it over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. You get really good at it. I mean, that, that would be true of uh, anybody playing a musical instrument or anybody becoming a, a, an athlete or anything, you know, you get, you get better. People get better as we do things and keep, keep doing them. You know, so. Gary, can I, can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Um, we're getting uh, questions are starting to build, which is great, but I, I myself have two questions or things I've heard you talk about before. One would be, um, when you're doing multi-layered music that is soft, medium, big, do you write the biggest cue first? And then when it comes down to the medium one or the ambient and the softer one, are they simply remixes with things being removed out of the big mix this way, key and tempo and the crossfading moment, doesn't matter where it is, it's going to work. Is that a technical procedure? And number two, um, since games take a long time to fully develop and you go through the testing, like you just said, do you work in a, do you write the music for a game, which is going to be well over two hours, I would imagine, uh, in chunks, and then you wait until things are tested and approved, and then another chunk, another chunk until you finish the project? Uh, I'll stop it there. Yeah, as far as layering, Larry, you've heard my lectures before. <laughs> that is that is how you write. You write, generally speaking, and I have done it the opposite. You write the most intense music first, and then you deconstruct it. Um, but what doesn't change? The tempo doesn't change. The the tonality doesn't change. The melodies don't change. But you will 
take things out, you will reorchestration. The orchestration can change. The, the, certainly the velocities, if you're a composer, you know how velocities can change the nature of the samples. So all those can, can really come into how the music becomes less intense. And if, let's say if, even if you have like a 16th note ostinato, it might become an eighth note ostinato. You can simplify it that way. So there's just a lot of different techniques you could use to essentially deconstruct, simplify, um, take things out, taking out lots of, if you have a lot of bombastic, intense percussion, you might take out half the percussion and bring down the volume of the other half, uh, or maybe even rework the percussion in general to make it less intense. You may take the brass down quite a bit, or maybe even remove the brass. Maybe then it becomes all strings, or maybe an a strings and octave playing a melodic line might become just the lower note of that octave. Um, and then when you do a slow crossfade, you know, over maybe two or three seconds, if, if, it's really remarkable how well it works. It really feels quite natural. If you've done it, if you've done it right, it feels quite natural. Um, the challenge can sometimes be if you've written really intense action music, and then it's, it's easy to get that layer two, because that's just sort of deconstructed. But then if you want an ambient version of that action music, where you're really taking out all, most of the ostinatos and percussion, now how do you do that? And that actually becomes quite uh, a, a, bit of, a bit of a challenge. I've, you know, you, because the music can become really boring if you don't do something interesting. So, and I start with, I, I you know, people ask me, well, do I start with the, with the action cue and then think about how I'm gonna do the ambient cue? And the answer is no. Because I'm just grateful I can find action music that works, and then I then I have the challenge of like somehow making an ambient version, and I somehow do. Um, one there was a cue in a Shadow of War. I think it was Shadow of War. I getting getting the cues mixed up, or Shadow of Mortar, one of those two Shadow of something games, and where um, Nate asked me, says, "What if you?" Because this there was a really emotional moment. Uh, Talion is the char the main character from those games. And so he, he had a city he lit, he was from called Minas Morgul. And in Minas Morgul was totally destroyed. It kind of sets off this whole adventure by this horrible character, Sauron, okay? So he becomes the nemesis throughout this game. And so they, 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 were, they wanted to keep, he says, what if you started with the ambient version first and wrote something really emotional? And, you know, and then, and I was, I was like, ooh, I've never done that before, <laughs> you know? But it was actually quite cool. And uh, it was it was a challenging, interesting, creative way to to approach it, and it de it delivered a different type of cue. It actually is one of those. It, it stimulated me to think about it differently, and therefore to write something I think that really worked. So often, you know, I think maybe this is a general rule for anybody uh, that you know, if you're doing something and sort of doing the same thing, repeating, you know, try try doing it differently. You know what I mean? Try something else. It can really sort of um, give you a, a really cool, um, you know, result that maybe you didn't expect. So at first you're like throwing back, well, I can't do that. You know, it's like you're used to writing with your right hand. All of a sudden, what happens you, when you write with your left hand? You know, um, so that was that was a creative experience. But I would say most of the time I am writing the most intense and then deconstructing it to create the other layers. And they do crossfade and they and and remember that they'll always fit because they're the same tempo, they're the same tonality, they're the same music essentially, just versions of it, you know. So that's that's really um, really cool. What was the, what was the other question um, about? Uh, it was just, and I know I was writing the blocks of. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you're when you start your gig, um, you're not going to write the entire plethora of the game music no. in, one, in one sitting. So I'm assuming you're waiting for development to catch up, and then you do yeah. a chunk, a chunk, and it may take you two years, you know, to, to complete a score. So that that that's the nature of that question. But otherwise, boy, the questions are piling up like. All right, well, we can do that. Like do you want to hear any music before we do that? Yeah, or? if you could do just do something just to wet the taste buds, but I think the Q and A is going to be significant. All right, cool. Well, we can do that. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll play the one you mentioned. Uh, Welcome to Rapture. It was kind of a cool score. So this is actually not. It wasn't a, a cinematic, but it's uh, it is it's um it's really written to picture. And so in Bioshock. You, you, those of you, many of you have probably played it. So you land, you know, your plane crashes, it's like 1960 and you're in the middle of the Atlantic. You're the only survivor of this plane crash. 
and you swim to a light stage, the only place you can swim to, you could you could play the game by swimming for like 20 or 30 hours in a circle, which would be a very boring way to play Bioshock. So, but you go to the one place that you want, that you can see, which is this, uh, this lighthouse, and you go into it and you already start to see some intriguing things. And then you go into this like a bathysphere, what they call the bathysphere, which is really like a kind of a submarine that's tethered. And it, and it goes down to the, to the city of Rapture, it's called Rapture, and it's really like New York City at the bottom of the ocean, okay? And so they wanted something that, um, for that, you know? The, the, actually, the music you're gonna hear is slightly abbreviated version, because I wrote a longer version of it, and then they, they sort of abbreviated it. Um, and I, there's actually some, you'll see some, um, the, like as you go down, like a little movie comes up, you know, kind of like a little, um, I don't know what you call it, a little like sales pitch of why why Rapture is so cool, you know, and uh, and there's actually I actually wrote some like newsreel kind of music because it would have been I just thought it it would be it's very newsreely looking and if anybody of you guys know what newsreels were they were like in the 1940s and 50s and 60s when you went to movie theaters they they would actually play the news in the theater because the television didn't exist, you know, before TV. So you'd actually see these news. So I wrote some newsreel music, which is actually quite fun to write newsreel music, and then crossfades into this music. Now, the first time I wrote this music, so Emily said, okay, you're going to the scariest place on earth. So I wrote a really scary cue and she came back. She says, it's too scary. So I said, okay, well, she says, my bad. She says, wrong direction you it make it mysterious make it sort of a mysterious place so that's what that's what this is and let me um let's see if i still have that movie file here yes all right so i'll share share my screen with you and then we'll take questions or i play more music or whatever you guys want to do Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. I rejected those answers. Instead, I chose something different. I chose the impossible. I chose rapture. A city where the artist would not fear the censor, where the scientist would not be bound by petty morality, where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well. So that's a little introduction to um, music, and that it was a really cool, it was a really cool project to to score. I'm really, really lucky to have had that opportunity. There's lots of different music in that, but um, so yeah. So let's take some questions and uh, and um, go where you want to go. Great, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. A lot of people are enjoying that. So uh, before we jump into questions here, and as you guys are thinking them, feel free to type in. I just wanted to mention real quickly that we'll be having another event next week, Monday um, at 7 p.m. We're gonna be having a little bit of a networking event to help combine the composition students here attending this event with game design students. So it'll be a great opportunity 
to meet some of the other people as much as we'd love to do this in person, uh, where that would be an easy place to foster that kind of uh, relationship and um, collaborative experience. You know, we'll have to do another follow-up event. Um, so with that being said, let's jump into a few questions here. Um, ben Yee Paulson was asking, um, and, and I think you could elaborate on this perhaps a little bit more given the, the evolution of the gaming industry and the education behind this, um, but how would young composers nowadays begin their careers in game composing and what kind of choices and decisions should they make to help foster that career career path? Yeah, that's, that's sort of like the question everybody wants to know, how do I get started? And of course, um, you have to date someone whose girlfriend then becomes a a producer and a game developer, <laughs> publisher, and then fax your resume. Um, no, look, it, it, is the, it is a tough question. And um, you really have to, you know, be proactive and start your career. I mean, I, I did mention going to the Game Developers Conference, um, but you have to, and that's a way to meet people. I've had some of my students at USC have gone to the Game Developers Conference and, and ended up working for years. Um, uh, Marco, Marco uh, D'Antonio's who have been working for Gordy Hobbs since he met him about four or five years ago, ever since. And he's been his assistant writing tons of music on all, of course they're doing lots of Star Wars music. Um, uh, so you can find work. Also he scored, a, he scored a game that he did there. Then other students have gone there and not had found those opportunities. But you have to obviously, in, in, it, it's not an easy profession to, to get into okay to get started I, that would be true of a film composer a game composer a television composer there's a lot of of competition so it, it, it you know you really have to be aware of that and you have to think have the mindset that you're going to you are determined to do this i think that's critical to be absolutely determined and and uh, but there's no sort of like there's there's no one path certainly a lot of young composers i think coming to la is still probably smart. I mean, maybe things are changing with COVID. It's not as critical, but certainly I would say 75 to 85%, 85.63% of composers live in LA of, of film and TV composers and game composers as well. So it, it, there is, it is still central, you know, this is where the agents who represent composers live and work, you know? So I, I think that is, is not necessarily a bad decision to make. Uh, not necessarily easy to do either because LA is an expensive town to live in and you know you 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 have to find some way to, to make a living <clears throat> while you're finding opportunities and meeting people but it is it's, it's about meeting people it's about writing music and writing really interesting music and it may be finding op opportunities in areas that you hadn't even thought of like production music production music is like library music or trailer music or just really anything that can earn you income while you're finding your your opportunities. And of course, working as an assistant for another composer is a really good way to start your career. A lot of composers do hire assistants and assistants can do everything from technical stuff that the composer doesn't have time to do to writing where they, they just don't have enough time that you become like a ghost. But essentially, that's what I was doing when I started with Mike and Pete. So really, it's it's just really putting yourself into the world, learning what games are being made, contacting developers. Your your opportunities on smaller projects are often better than on the big triple A games because that's like getting you know starting your career scoring a you know a Marvel two hundred million dollar Marvel movie. It's unlikely that's going to happen. Um, it, it might happen though. I mean, look look the kind of kind of opportunity. That was pretty, pretty amazing on Black Panther. Um, so, you know, and whatever I tell you, there, there'll be some other way that I can't even think of that you'll find an opportunity. So I, there, I don't have the definitive answer to that complex question, but it is get involved, get into it, find opportunities, contact developers. My uh, uh, One of my uh, friends, Gareth Coker, um, he, he scored a game, um, oh, what is it called? Um, really? Ori. Ori, of course, he scored Ori, and he worked on it for two years. It was a small game, but when it came out, it really did well, and his score was gorgeous. He wrote this really beautiful score, and it just elevated his career from like 
almost like a, a nowhere to like someone now who's been working ever since and you know has really really done well another friend of mine austin wintry scored journey and journey was a small game that exploded and became a very successful game and his score was nominated for all kinds of awards you know uh, so i mean and and won a number of awards so those are the kind of things that um you make contacts and you and, and i mean there's i would work with the people at your school at india and iu you know and meet the developers there and and score their games if if, if you can make a connection to someone and score their game um, you never know what any of the developers working at your school, they may find um, their career blossoming and then contact you to help them score something they're working on. So there, there's no, those are just sort of like some of the things you need to do. And it may be that you reach out um, and just, you know, cold call or cold email or contact people who are like the audio professionals at various game companies and, and ask if, if you can um if you can send them a demo you know but make sure your demo is good and don't and if you do sense if you do send people in whether it's a composer or a game audio director or whatever if you send them something do not do not create like a template and then just send them send everybody the same template make sure you personalize it to that individual because people can smell when it's like i can I, when people send me stuff it's like dear gary and then i read something that could be for anybody, you know, really, it's it's just you know they're sending out. I, I often just ignore those, you know. So, great. Well, thank you. Um, and also, just as a little side note uh, on how to build experience, this is part of what we were hoping with this event is to help build that relationship in our in our um, collaborative events, so that the composition students here have the opportunity to work with some game composers, uh, game designers on some of their projects. So, that's great that you're able to talk about all of that. I'm going to try to combine a bunch of questions as we go through these because we have a ton coming in here. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to Ryan's here. How do you prepare for a piece for a how do you prepare a piece for a sudden change such as a fight that can be started at different points and what makes a new piece slot in well? Perhaps this is a little bit of an extension from what you're talking about with Larry's question. So how do you prepare a piece? Well, of course, in games, you never know when the fight's going to begin. So there's no way you can prepare it within the loop. However, you could have a piece of music that ramps into a combat situation. It could, it can, and it could ramp very quickly over maybe one bar or even a couple of beats. It's like a kind of a, a, a crescendo that built into and then crossfade into a piece of combat music. So um, you obviously need to know how quickly that occurs. And then you could create something that um, you you would want to mind the tonality, but you might also write have something that is a is non tonal, so it may be a, peak, a piece of percussion or like a cymbal swell or some kind of a cluster or whatever that builds and then go into the um, go into the uh, combat or action music. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to Allison's question, this is a great one. Uh, at what stage of game development do you, the composer, usually get to start working? Do you usually have well-developed visuals to compose to, just concept art, just ideas? Does the stage you're working at change how much your approach, uh, change how you approach composing? Yes, um, it, it varies on project to project. But it can be somewhere in the middle. Usually, they start to think, "Well, we're starting to. We we should probably bring a composer on." I remember when I worked on Destroy All Humans, they brought me on pretty much at the end of the process, and I had like sixty days to write sixty minutes of music. Which at the time, because I was doing lots of TV, that was like pretty generous, you know. Um, and now I'm I'm working on like two projects, and so sometimes I will have nothing to do for a week or two, and then I'll come back as they give me. Um, you know, the, the next, they're prepared for the next. So it's, I would say it's often in the middle, somewhere in the middle, and that, you know, I, precisely I can't say. Um, and and they're asking you, of course, at, at those times to like maybe write some thematic material or whatever to, to kind of like start the process of finding the musical tone for the, for the game. Um, and what was the rest of your question? 
Um, so yeah, they were just asking what stage are, are the visuals in and how does that change oh, yeah, your and, approach? And so, to... so yeah, the visuals, so very opt if it's early, they may not actually have any gameplay video they can provide. So they will send you art. You'll actually send you some art, give you basically conception art. Whoops. And you'll see these various locations and characters And sometimes I've had literally just a bit of art to write a whole cue to, though generally not. Generally, you'll have some kind of gameplay video. So that's that's the actually see this see this image right here. So this was for was from Front Mission, and I had to write a whole cue based upon this character. His name in the in the game is Dylan, and he is he in the in this game you play uh, you you control these. Um, robots and you battle in these robots okay they're called wanzers and you have to design your own wanzer based upon its characteristics see if you want one that's very fast it may not have good armor but it may be it might, the speed would be interesting or you may have a very heavily armored wanzer that can take a lot of punishment but then it's slow and sort of lumbers along so you have to make those choices so they want a piece of music and this is all i had to write that but that's that's fairly rare um, that that's that is all you have, but um, let's see. Find some movie files. More often, you have something like this, where you see you're seeing gameplay. Does that make sense, Allison? Cool. Great. Uh, another question here is about some of the programs that you're using to work with. Um, so what programs, digital audio workstations, and notation softwares do you use to compose the video game music? And I would like to add a little bit of addition. How are you interacting with the compositions with the video game designers? Are you sending typically just audio files or are you working with programs that are more integrating the audio files into the, the games? I'm using Digital Performer, which I really happy with that Larry uses it too. Um, I think Rick Marvin uses it. Is that correct, Rick? Are you still here? Um, so it's a very sophisticated application. There, of course, there's Logic and Cubase and people use all kinds of stuff. And it really doesn't matter as long as if the music, if they're digging the music, you're you're cool, you know. Um, but DP is very, very old program. I mean, it's been updated, but it's been around for a long time and it's very sophisticated and it works extraordinarily well. It does what I want to do and I can, make and i also use an application called ve vienna ensemble pro which is which i use for all my samples so it sort of is a separate application that connects to dp and dp sends midi to it and then that audio comes back into dp and i can and i've got a very very large um, um uh, template of i mean literally probably there's like six or seven or eight hundred um um, different tracks I have in my template. So it's quite massive, you know, um, probably I should get rid of about 200 of them, but I, I can't quite part. I get, I guess, I'll never use it again, but I, I want it there, you know? Um, so it's, it's, and all of these can be, you know, you know, MIDI can be sent to them that it comes back into DP and then I can record that. And I record it as stereo. Usually all they want is a stereo wave file and I'm in 24, bit 48 kilo, um, kilohertz and that's what I deliver I export it and send it to them you know just upload it right now I'm using uh, we're using um, Dropbox to share those files sometimes they want technologies that that share that are very private and you can share things that are in, in more sophisticated ways but uh, it's, right now they're happy with Dropbox so it's, it's working and, and that's that's pretty much it you know producing the files and and sending it to them. I don't implement the music, so I don't use any kind of implementation software because it's that's done in-house. Certainly in AAA games, they always have an audio director or music, music director even, sometimes a person who does nothing but implement and um, create the music and, and work on the music. And they will actually put it in the game and implement it. And I've never been asked to implement it. That's not to say that there aren't opportunities for for composers, and I would recommend anybody who really wants to get into game music to learn how to use the implementation software tools like Wise or FMod, 
because if you do have those skills, if you really know how to use them well, you may find that there's a job more audio oriented, but if once you get into the developer, you might find an opportunity to write some music for it as well. And it's, it, it would be a job job where, I mean, you literally have health insurance and um, paycheck, which is kind of cool for people starting their careers, you know? So, um, but that said, I've never learned those software products because I have been working on, on projects. And, and, and at this point in my career, I don't, I don't really want to implement audio. It's just not, I'm not interested. I'd much rather spend my time writing the music. So if, they, if someone wants to hire a composer that also implements, I would not be the right person. For that. But most of the time they don't really care about that. All they want is really good music and then they're going to put it in their game. So. Cool. Uh, this might actually be a little bit on the implementation side, but I, I'd be interested to hear your response. Um, who in the pipeline is choosing how much interact interactivity a piece of game music ha will have? Are you the one who decides where loops, stingers, and layers will be triggered? And uh, on the game side, who, who's going to be making those decisions? And I guess I would add also, do you ever have a say on any of those decisions or those types of sounds? All right. Yeah. Um... Most of the time, it's either the audio director or the music director who is making those choices. So they're, they're giving me assignments, essentially, that involve providing assets that match what they want to do with the music. So they might they'll say, okay, I want a three-layered cue, and I want some stingers, and I want an intro and an outro. And you know, so, you're, so you have a whole list of assets you need to provide to finish that assignment, essentially. So that's that's what I do, and then I give it to them, and then they put it into the game. Uh, I have had times where I have had opportunities to make suggestions, implementation suggestions, and I think I actually have some pretty good ideas uh, on how to do that, and I do make suggestions, um, but often they don't want that. They just want me to be creative and write the music and throw it over the fence, and then they do what they will with it, you know, um, and sometimes they, I don't even want to know what they do with that because it's like, you know, as they say, if you knew how sausage was made, you wouldn't eat it. Um, I think sometimes if you knew what they do with your music, you wouldn't be too pleased. But I just you write the best music I can, throw it into the sausage maker and hope it comes out for the best. You know? Gary, do you have to give it stems like we do in film music? Do you have to give a ton of stems? Y yes. And no, sometimes they want lots of stems. Like when I work for Sony, Sony has their own sort of music department that when you work for them, you deliver tons and tons and tons of stems. I do create stems, but that, especially if I'm doing an orchestral project, I create stems that then permit when we mix to choose which of the stems I want to use or not use or how loud any one of those individual stems should be. Um, but I don't, I don't, um, and, and again, sometimes I will, I will deliver in multiple stems because they'll request it. So it just depends on the request. So, so yeah, sometimes they say, give us the strings, brass, percussion, effects, all on separate stems. So it might be four or six different stems. And other times it, they don't want, and they just want a stereo file. And then the stems only come into play when I'm doing an orchestral mix of it. Um, if they ask for the stems, I'm happy to deliver it. But yes, so I've had both. I've had both sort of full stemming where they want everything, moderate stemming where they just want sort of aggregate, aggregated uh, string section. It could be even more fine grained than that, where you have the high strings and low strings separated out, and similarly with brass or whatever. So you might they might want ten stems, you know. So I'm certainly with television and films you're going to be delivering in stems because they want to have the ability to um, bring down a sound if it's fighting dialogue or, or whatever, you know, they want to remix your music on the fly sometimes and sometimes not. But of course, when you deliver stems, you if, every, if all the faders are at zero dB, it sounds just like the stereo mix. Um, and then if they want to push or pull one particular stem, they can, they have that option. Great. Well, we also have some game designers here as well. So I'm going to try to find a few, a few questions in our thread here that are a little more focused towards their aspect of the collaboration and how it relates to the, the music. Um, so I've got one here from Benjamin. How closely do you work with the narrative team on games? Um, they're asking more specifically about the use of motifs 
um, and big moments calling back to other areas in the game and characters. Well, I work very really closely with them. I, obviously, you know, I, I my joke is I can write anything I want as long as they like it. Um, but really, you are um, writing music that fits different parts. And if there's characters, then uh, and you've written a motif for that character, then you're going to use it later in the game. And so, yes, they're going to be referencing cross references. There may be a reason not to reference it, but usually you are going to be referencing those themes and motifs throughout the game when you see those different characters or locations, you know, if it's some, you know, castle of the, of the king or whatever, you know, the, those are, have music that, you know, so just as you would in a film, you know, so really, yes, you are using um, those motifs and you're definitely coordinating that and talking to the developer about it. And um, them, they may even say, okay, here, th there's a new, there's this new cue we want you to do and we want you to reference this main character because uh, you, you may not want to reference her, like I'm working on a game now and the main character is a woman, and so you may want, want to, you don't want to like, you know, just repeat it over and over and over again. So you want to be subtle with it. It might, you may just sort of hint at the theme, or you may really want to drive it home because this is like really a major character moment, you know, and then really hit, hit the theme hard there. So those are all often driven by the developer or they may be me going, hey, what if I use the theme here for X, Y, Z? Would that, wouldn't that be, and then they go, yeah, that's, that would be great, you know? So it, it can be collaborative or it could be like they have an idea that they want you to implement. Great, and actually here's a really important question, I think for the collaborative process that we're gonna be working on here. Uh, from a game designer's perspective, how can <laughs> game designers help a composer make a soundtrack that really supports the game? At what stage of development should a games designer start considering the composition? Well, I think, I do think probably bringing you on in the middle is good so that you have the time to develop some ideas and to experiment and to make some mistakes and try other things to other ideas and kind of really kind of toss things around. And, and that was true in Bioshock where I was brought in early enough to try different things and things were not working. And then one day I sort of had an epiphany, like, hey, this would be, what if, what, what about what about this? I, I thought of something that would really be, I thought, interesting. And I sent it to Emily and she says, that's it. That's the sound of Bioshock. And uh, we were off and running. Uh, it was it was a, a kind of a nice moment. I was like, yes. I, I felt actually very strongly about the idea. It was really, I thought, inter an interesting one that seemed to fit, you know, and it, it had a unique vibe to it. So it, it was just, but it took a while. And so, um, Hopefully you have um, a developer or a audio director or whatever that is patient, you know, that is willing to give you some time and doesn't, you know, sometimes someone might panic, like if you're not getting it right away, they might go, oh, I hired the wrong person. Oh no, you know, but they need to give you the time and to experiment and to, you know, really have, as they call, as they say, dream time to, to, to play with it. So, um, yeah, does that answer the question? So bring, yeah. I think bringing you in in the middle is good and giving you time to develop your ideas and have them to, as the game is being developed and put it into the builds of the game and see how it's working, you know, and give you feedback. It's sort of a feedback loop. I guess that's true in film scoring as well, you know, but you send something, they listen to it, put it into a, it could be in a scene in a film or it could be a game um, in a game and gameplay and test it and how does it work, you know, and maybe get feedback from other people on the team. Um, when, when you put it into a game's uh, build, now everybody who is working on the game, all the different aspects, and it, and it might be as many as 100 people who are working on a, in a big team. I mean, that's a really big team. Like in Bioshock Infinite, it was a big team. And so all of a sudden they're hearing that music for the first time too. And they may have some input go, wow, this is great. It might be as simple as like, wow, I'm really loving that. Or, hey, you know, maybe that's not work. I mean, they may have some, they may have some negative input as well. So, um, but all, all that is part of the process of finding the, the score, you know. Great. And I think we got time for one last question. So I'm going to try to combine a couple here that I've been reading. Uh, have you ever worked on a project where a game and audio directors repeatedly ask you to rewrite the music? Um, and how do you handle that process? Have you ever had to dilute things down a little bit? 
How did you handle those kinds of experiences? Yeah, I, I have had situations like that. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, we had my class last year, Tom Newman came in, he was talking about working on 1917, the movie, and he talked about rewriting cues over and over and over again, you know, uh, for Sam Mendes. So this is really common. And, you know, um, hopefully as you, you're getting good feedback and you're understanding what it is that they're wanting from the music. But I mean, it's the responsibility of the composer to keep working at it until you get it. I mean, it may, it may, at some point it may be like, whoa, I'm missing something here. I'm not really getting it or they're not digging it. Um, but I've, I've somehow always managed to find it. I've, I've, you know, you know, sometimes it's funny because sometimes it's like they're digging like version ones over. They're like, we're, Approved, approved, approved. Other times it's like, there. Sometimes it's like you're being nibbled to death by ducks. You know, it's like little quibbles. You know, you know, and it's just like, okay, okay. And you're making all these changes, and it's not changing that much, but it's like little things. It's like they never, it never ends. You know, and then other times it's like, whoa, what you really missed the boat here. You know, you're, you're, what were you we thinking? And of course, you get into things like temp music. Sometimes temp music can be very ha helpful. Like, for instance, on this game I'm doing now. There was this one uh, cue I was writing, and it was um, it's it's like this the capital of this um, fictional city, okay? And it's like and I tried a couple things and then and they um, and it didn't quite work for them. So then I said, "Can you give me send me anything from any source? Just anything? They're like, what what is the where kind of?" On, will this you know and they sent me something that was actually quite helpful and and they sent me something by another composer another game composer but he was right his music sounded in that very much like Rafe von Williams who's a famous English composer who I'm a huge fan of and so I go okay I get it and so then I wrote something von Williams esque you know which was fun it was fun to do something really sort of beautiful and emotional in that sort of like style that he he is well known for. And that was very helpful to me to get that feedback that was more than just like, eh, it's not right. It's not feeling right. You know, that can be, okay, well, and, and here's why it's not right. But sometimes words, words do not, you can, sometimes you can tell somebody what's wrong, but you can't tell them which direction to go in. And, and sometimes you, and sometimes I really immediately get it. And other times it's like, can you just give me, is there any kind of music that you can think of that would kind of be in the right direction? Because once I know the direction, I feel like I can write it, you know? But sometimes I'm just like, you know, it's, I'm, what are they thinking? And I'm, not, and I'm sort of struggling to find that. And then when they can provide something like, like what they did in that the, the thing, I just told you about this capital. And I said, okay, that's, real, that's Ray Fun Williams-ish to me. That's how it sounded until I wrote something and they were, they loved it, so. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was really insightful to have all of your insight from inside the gaming industry and how composition side of things and the nerdy side of that, and also how it interacts with the game developers. So it was a really insightful conversation. So thank you very much for coming sure. and talking with us today. It was really nice. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. My pleasure. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for inviting me, Larry. Thank you so much, Gary. That was just, just terrific. Thank you. Good, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right. Everybody, write make some good games, write some great music. It's a great it's a great business. It is such a cool business. I love writing music for games and films. I mean, it's it's I just it's just really uh, such a cool industry and uh, I wish you all well and, and to find your opportunity because it's it's to me the best. It's just really I just love what I do.